Thank you for joining us for tonight's event on designing sustainable retirement systems in the current environment of ultra low yields. This event is part of the Integrated Management Symposium series made possible through the support of our great benefactor, Marcel Desotel. And this special edition is sponsored by the Global Risk Institute in Financial Services. I will launch the discussion with some facts, key facts that Venda was alluding to uh, and that are necessary to understand the complexity of the problem we face tonight. This is the life expectancy in Canada at age 65, so at retirement age. From 1982 to 2018, life expectancy at retirement age has gone up by four years. That's one year per decade. Very good news, but from the perspective of pension plans, that's more years to cover. In parallel, at the same time, bond yields went down. They went down from 15% per year in 1982, all the way down to 2% per year today. That's a major change, right? So not only do we have to cover for more years out of retirement, but the tools that we have are not yielding as much as they used to. And this is Canada. If we look at in the Netherlands, the situation is worse. You look on the right, yields are negative. Right? So you put a dollar invested, 10 years later, you will have less than a dollar. And so you require huge contributions in order to make the system work. Right? So today that raises an important question that I would like to address to you, Barbara and Edward. Are we at the bottom of an extended cycle, hoping, expecting rates to go up? Many plans are hoping for rates to go back up. Or are we in a new normal? in which case we can expect yields to stay low for a long time. I'd love to get your thoughts on this. Okay. Why don't we start with an easy question. Um, <laughs> so um, I think hope is not a great strategy, just generally for a pension plan. Um, but if you think of real interest rates, they should really um, long term follow the trend of economic growth. So a lot of economists would say that's about 1.5% when you look at the demographics look at labor productivity, and real return bonds are, you know, the long end is around 0.2 in Canada. So that's pretty low. And, um, and then you think, well, what would make them rise? Right? There's a lot of what would keep them down. And I would actually argue there's probably more pressures keeping them down than keeping them up. So I firmly believe that, you know, over time, the yields will actually recover and they will be a better reflection of what is happening in, in the real economy. But that is not gonna happen overnight. I mean, but the one thing that we, that we really have to focus on is like, what are the, the intentions of, you know, related to the, the drastic measures that we've taken? And we see the tapering already starting. So QE is slowly but steadily taken out of the equation. You know, we see central banks, uh, you know, talk about inflation and they might actually raise interest rates again. Um, and I think it's really dependent on how the market is going to react on it, what the risk premium is going to do. So, you know, I cannot say it's going to happen like in the next few months, but I certainly believe that we will uh, come to a normalization where yields will be around 4 to 5% again. The World Economic Forum predicts that in aggregate, there is going to be a retirement savings shortfall of $400 trillion by 2050. Now, I don't know about you, but those numbers seem concerning uh, to me. But then what's interesting is when we look at the Canadian pension fund model, and we have two leaders of funds that are doing well, uh, this is a model that is an exception to this trend. I have done research on this model. We have found that the model does quite well, actually. Canadian funds outperform their peers in terms of returns and do a better job at hedging their risks at the same time. Why is this? So we dealt further. We looked at data on the characteristics of these funds. What we saw um, was that, well, number one, and this is uh, an open, uh, well-known fact, there is a lot of in-house management by these funds, up to 80% in some cases. Um, that allows for a broader expertise within the funds, but also a reduction in cost, about one-third of cost being saved. And what's interesting is those costs are not going back into the, the pensioners' pockets. No, they're being redeployed inside the funds. 
They're being redeployed in two ways. First, redeployed across every single asset class to grow the internal capabilities of the funds. Uh, so hiring talent, greater risk management expenses, greater IT expenses, you see it everywhere. So greater value added across the board. Uh, but also at the same time, a greater allocation of funds in strategic asset classes, and in particular, the real estate and infrastructure. The Canadian funds invest much more in these asset classes, and you find that they help to diversify the portfolio, generate the additional returns, uh, but also align the assets and the liabilities uh, by decreasing the risks. Now, I'd like to hear from you. Uh, you're leading these funds. Based on your experience, what is it that has been so critical to the success of these funds that we don't see elsewhere in the world? I remember in Ontario Teachers, we started with 100% non-marketable Ontario debentures. 1990. Mm -hmm. It was privatized that year. So they had to use derivatives. And the first for the chair of the board, where's my risk system? If you guys are doing derivatives, where's my risk system, right? Let me understand the risk that you're taking. And so that really actually created that innovative spirit. It's like, you know, we actually had a real problem and we had to innovate. And you know, we actually started in real return bonds when it was over 3.5% yield, close to 4. That was a no-brainer. Um, the real return bonds, the commodities, trying to you know, go out and explain that you're going to do commodities at the pension plan. So we start really small, prove that you can do it, and then you're allowed to grow it over time. You know, private equity, today seems like, you know, of course you do it. It wasn't a private equity market in Canada at the time. You know, um, leverage, which is something that you haven't mentioned, but a lot of the big plans use leverage. Not heard of in a lot of countries. Actually, it's not allowed in a lot of countries. And so, you know, by bit by bit, by proving that you can do it within the risk framework, get the talent, get, um, responsibilities dedicated to management, and it all starts to work together. Um, what I like about the Canadian model, and that's exactly what, um, what Barb is saying, when the, uh, when the Canadian model was introduced, um, you know, roughly 20 years ago, it was very clear that it was all about value creation long term. So let's talk more about long term value creation. What you're suggesting here is we're talking about the, the low yields, the pension crisis, but there is a silver lining here. There's an opportunity to create long-term value, uh, but that requires sticking on risk. Controlled risk, but risk nonetheless. Now, investing in risky assets is one thing. Communicating it to plan members is another. Um, so in terms of communication, <laughs> I think the Netherlands is actually a very interesting case how not to do it um, and you know I'm not sure whether the, the, the lack of communication with the members and other stakeholders forced actually part of the reforms that we see now which is bad because I firmly believe that solidarity is so important for everyone to have a, a proper uh, pension that that should be actually at the high end of, of, um, of the discussion. Yes, so I think the earlier bar charts really show that it's really hard for people to appreciate the complexity around saving for retirement, right? Mm -hmm. The long-term nature, understanding what you need to save is, is very hard for the average person. And I think, um, you know, if I go back to my previous experience, well, Talking about the outdated DB model, because you have DB everywhere there, <laughs> um, that's the wrong message, that you have a defined, absolutely defined benefit, right? Because that gives the impression to the retirees, that when I retire, there's a defined formula, I will get my indexing every year, and that's not the model that you can do. The guarantees are really expensive, and that's why having a group and sharing the risk is really important. And it's intuitive, if you think of a, like, your stage in the retirement plan. When do you have the most saved in your retirement plan? Is right around retirement or right after retirement? And guess what? I still have to earn that 5.5% return on that big pool of money, and all the risk is going to go to somebody else? Right? That's a hard concept to tell that someone else, right? And you see a lot of plans aging where, you know, they used to have 10 actives for every retiree, 
Okay, so you lose a dollar, you give everyone 10 cents, but now they're one for one, right? So how can you lose a dollar in the retiree money and give it to an active person? So this risk sharing is really important and we don't have a magic bullet, but it's an important part to have these levers to say, how am I going to share risk with the active population and how I'm gonna share risk with the retirees? Who makes that decision? What governance group makes that decision? And in a lot of the pension plans in Canada, it's actually done by the representatives, so the employer and the employee groups together. So they share the risk, they share the governance. And so we start with, you know, who makes these decisions on behalf of the members? You have to tell them in the good times, because when the bad times come, it's too late. <laughs> and so that's already part of the thought process is how do you communicate. What do you expect will be the most important innovation in the retirement industry in the next 10 years? What's going to be groundbreaking coming up? Well, I would like to see more around, you know, these pension plans all have to change for, and I think it relates to the other question I saw a second ago, around climate change. And the investment that we all collectively have to do for that is huge. Right? And so how do you fit it within the model? How do you set targets? How do you actually operate the plan with a return objective? And you know this is consistent with fiduciary duty, and I don't have time to go into that right now, but I think that is a really important innovation over the next 10 years to figure out how to do that. I think, you know, keep, um, there's some really interesting smaller plans that are doing things around um, DB Plus, where, you know, they are trying to attach, bring in small employers. There's um, OP Trust have a select program, and I think that will be important to see how those um, smaller innovations are also, I would say UPP is an interesting innovation, but there's also a couple other experiments on there. Commonwealth also has one that they are trying to bring in um, more groups together and build that kind of uh, more sizable group, both in terms of people and assets. In addition, I, I would like to say, or. I think there is still work to do in terms of um, on the risk side of, of the pension plans and even if you really go back to the very core, like a statement in, the, in, uh, uh, in terms of what is your risk tolerance really? That sounds like a very straightforward question. The reality is actually very, very hard to come up with a clear risk tolerance statement. And by the way, once we enter in, in the situation that it really starts to hit you, then certainly we want to change that risk tolerance statement again. Um, and that doesn't help in, in terms of creating stability over time. So I think it's, it's still you know, risk tolerance and then related to that, what is the true risk sharing that we put in place it's going to be crucial for the, the pension plans going forward. I'm uh, thankful for your uh, dedication to come here at McGill, speaking to us and sharing your insights. Thank you. Thank you.